Hello YouTube. Today we're going to do some micro econ and we're going to do a bit of practice problems. Uh, just a simple supply and demand quick practice problem. Shouldn't be too long. And then we're going to go into a PPF example, a production possibility frontier. Um, so let's get started. So here's an example problem I found online. So it says using the supply and demand equations for the market of milk. Uh, milk is in the quantity of millions of gallons. Uh, you're given two equations and it's asking you to find what's the equilibrium price. Well, what you want to do is pretty much graph these lines and set them equal to each other, or you could set the equations equal to each other. Because remember, the equilibrium price is when the supply and the demand intersect um, where there's equilibrium. And to do that, you have an equation for this line and an equation for this line, which are given here, and you set those two equations equal to each other to solve. So I'm going to set that up. So you see I set up the graph over there so you can see it. Um, and the equilibrium point is that red dot, and again, that's where quantity supplied equals quantity and demand, so we're going to set that up. So the quantity supplied is P minus 1, and the quantity demanded is 9 minus P. Those are the equations for the two lines. And we're going to solve for the equilibrium price, or P. So you add P to both sides, and you get 2P equals 10, and that means P equals 5. So your price is at $5. So we figured out that part here. Now we want to know what the quantity demanded is. How much uh, do people are willing to buy it for at that price? So you simply plug in the price into the quantity demanded equation, and that would be 9 minus 5, which would be 4. So quantity demanded would be 4. And remember, this is in millions of gallons, so technically it's 4 million gallons. Um, but we don't need to do that exactly, but yeah. Okay, so now what happens? Let's go to part B. If the government decides to provide a one dollar subsidy for each gallon of milk, what is the new equation for supply? What is the new equilibrium price? Etc. Okay, whatever. So if you are given a subsidy, a subsidy pretty much is the government paying whoever uh, money to produce more. Um, so, if I'm giving you a dollar for every orange you produce out of your orange garden or orange tree or whatever you have going in the back, in your backyard, for example, you're going to want to produce more oranges, right? Because you're getting paid to produce more. So, what this does in the market is it shifts the supply to the right um, or increases supply. Now, I'm going to show that increase in supply as a darker shade of green here, and it'll be the line like this, and we'll call this S2 or S squared. No. I'll just say S2. Um, so, that's what it does um, graphically. Now, what does that do to the equation? Well, if you remember, the equation is QS equals P minus 1, which is at the top, so I guess you don't need to remember that. You just need to look. So, if you have QS equals P minus 1. Um, so, this is the price. And if I add a dollar to every... Um, if I'm giving you a dollar for every orange you produce, for example, if this were orange, or I guess we'll just do the real one, this is milk. So if I give you a dollar for every gallon of milk you produce, that means I'm changing your supply by one. I'm adding a dollar. So P minus one plus one turns into QS equals just P. So that's the new equation for the supply. But what is the new equilibrium price and the quantity of milk? Well, you do the same thing. Remember, uh, quantity supply equals quantity demanded. But now we're going to use this equation here for our quantity supplied. Simple mathematics of intercepting uh, of two lines intersecting. Uh, so same thing. You have, well now you just have P equals um, P equals the quantity demanded which is 9 minus P and you solve for P, add P to both sides and then divide by 2, so I guess I'll show the work, so 2p equals 9, and then I'm going to come over here, even though it's not, you know, then you get p equals $4.50, because 9 divided by 2 is 4.5, and that is your price, so that is your new equilibrium price, so, and you can show that here on the graph as well, but now, you got to figure out what the quantity demanded is. So same thing, you plug in the price, but you plug it in for the quantity demanded equation, which is the equation in blue. And then you get 9 minus 4.5, which is 4.5. So coincidentally, they both are the same, but remember, this is uh, dollars, and this is 4.5 million gallons, technically. So that's your quantity. 
and you can put that here as well on the graph. Okay, so we'll just answer this last question uh, kind of, well, I guess I can maybe squeeze it in there in writing, but so how much does the, how much total does the government pay farmers? So if the government pays you a dollar or pays you a dollar to your milk company for every gallon of milk you produce, how much is the government paying you? Well, with this new shift, you are um, now have 4.5 million gallons. So if I give you a dollar for every gallon you have, that means you have $4.5 million that is spent by the government, which is then given to you if you are the company. So is this efficient? No, because the government is giving you money, and it's kind of, you know, causing a shift in the market when the normal equilibrium price would be here. Um, and the quantity demanded, you know, changed and all that. So it's, it's not efficient because... Ugh, let me try a better explanation. Pretty much it means that, you know, the, your, the company is spending more to produce so that they could get paid, um, and it's actually what it's less valued in the market. You know, the normal equilibrium, all things equal, is there. But when you're kind of, you know, fix the deck kind of thing or something else influences, it's not as efficient as it was before. And why? This is because of something called dead weight loss. Um, there is an area here, actually, um, that is affected. And that is lost in society, I guess you could say. All right, moving on. So now we're going to go over PPFs or production possibility frontiers uh, to answer these questions. So Maria and Anna are producing shirts and ties. Um, the way to determine the opportunity cost, uh, first we'll start with Maria. The maximum she can produce is 12 shirts. Um, you can tell by um, if she produces zero ties, she can produce 12 shirts. Um, and the maximum amount of ties she can produce is are five ties. Um, with Anna, you have her maximum amount of ties she can produce is 10, and her also the maximum amount of shirts she can produce is 10. So knowing that, if you want to find the opportunity cost, you should make a proportion. So for every one shirt, that would be 5 ties, or 5 twelfth ties, so you just kind of like the 5 twelfths of both sides. And if you want to do it for every one tie for Maria, one tie, you would have opposite, so 12 and over 5 shirts. The numbers are kind of weird, but this one I guess will try to make more sense. Well, this one actually is too easy, but... So, that means for this one's obviously one tie for every one shirt, one shirt for every one tie, same thing. So... Those are pretty much the costs there, but who has the comparative advantage? Well, the person who has the comparative advantage is the person with the lowest opportunity cost. Remember that, lowest opportunity cost. Um, pretty much it would be Anna because it's, it's one shirt. She can produce one shirt versus um, Maria who can produce 12 over 5 shirts. And since one is lower than... Um, like about two and a half or so, uh, it she has the lower opportunity cost, therefore the comparative advantage. Okay, now we're going to go on to the combined PPF. So combined PPF is pretty much um, production possibility frontier. It means like what's the maximum output if these two were, people were to work together to produce shirts and ties? Well, if you look here, uh, 12 is the maximum Maria can produce, and 10 is the maximum Anna can produce. So if they all work, or if they both work to produ produce just shirts, that means they would have 22 shirts um, and zero ties. Now, uh, for ties, Anna can produce 10, Maria can produce 5, so if they all work to produce, um, or if they both work to produce just ties, they would have 15 ties. So now the question is, well, how does this overlap? Like, where, where are we going here? So, who would be, who would have, who would want to produce, um, who has the comparative advantage, pretty much? Um, the line, a PPF usually looks like this, and the reason being is someone produces uh, a good first, and then this person produces a good second, or a company, a country, whatever. And this point here, um, 
is pretty much where it's they transition. That's that point of transition, and you can find that by finding the maximum that they can produce for each. So the maximum amount amount of shirts would be 12, and who owns that? That would be Maria. And the maximum amount of ties that can be produced is 10, and that's for Anna. So you know that this point here is going to be 12, and you know that this point here, this is obviously not drawn to scale, is going to be 10. So now the question is, who's producing first? Well, you could calculate the slopes, or you could look at the opportunity cost. So since we figured that Anna had the lower opportunity cost, the slope is negative 1, so that means Anna would be producing the goods first. And then you could calculate this slope, or you could look again at the opportunity costs. And since this slope is steeper, um, you can also show that it would be that negative 2 whatever uh, slope. And this would be by Maria. So these are the, these are the combined possibility frontiers. Um, so... I guess that's what's important here. Anything else to note? Okay, I think we're good. So, oh, I guess we'll touch on a little something. So if they were to produce here, for example, that would be inefficient productivity. However, if they produced out here, um, this would just be unattainable. That value is unattainable. There's no way they can reach these values because they're combined efforts um, and time and whatever. They just can't make it. There's no way. Um, so that's one thing to note too, so unattainable and efficient. Okay, so if they each want six shirts and they agree to trade one shirt for five ties, or half a tie, how many shirts do they produce and consume? Okay, so if they both want six ties, so, well, who has a comparative advantage, uh, pretty much? Who can make, if they each want six shirts, that's a total of 12 shirts, so who can who produces the 12? Um, that would be Maria. So Maria, what she can do is she can produce all the shirts. So Maria produces 12 shirts. And then she consumes 6. So consume 6 shirts. So she has 6 left over to trade. So that means Anna will get her 6 shirts. So consumes 6 shirts. So that means she would make zero ties, zero T. Um, so, and if that they make the trade, well, we don't even know. We don't really, the question doesn't even ask about Anna. So that's how they would get the trade pretty much. She would, since she is more efficient in making the shirts, she would just make all the shirts and trade them for ties because um, they agreed to do it for one shirt as half a tie. So that means um, she would also consume, I believe, three ties. Yeah. Cool. All right. So hope this helps. Just a good example to go through and practice if you are um, working on produ production possibility, production possibility frontiers, and some basic subsidies uh, and how they apply in, in supply and demand.